Okay, we are all now experts in MATLAB, and we are ready to dive into the electromagnetics and finite difference time domain. So in this lecture, there are a few things that we need to review from electromagnetics and Maxwell's equations. I'm not intending in this course to teach electromagnetics, but obviously it needs to come up. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to minimize that, but there are certain things we need to do. So when I review Maxwell's equations, my purpose here is not to teach them, but to draw some pictures associated with them that will come up again a little bit later in this course and review some important things that uh, will come up and find a different time, like boundary conditions and how different parameters are related. I might give you a problem with refractive index. You'll need to convert that over to permittivity, for example. Once we're done that, then we will officially introduce finite difference time domain and start talking about the mathematics and the basic engine that is behind finite difference time domain. Next lecture, we'll start formulating useful equations and building codes. Here is a one-page summary of pretty much all of classical electromagnetics, including all of Maxwell's equations in their various forms, time domain, frequency domain, integral, differential, the constitutive relations, the names, the units of all the parameters, different constants that are useful, and the Lorentz force law. Uh, on my website, you can get a much higher resolution version of this if it's not looking good on your, on your PDF file or whatever. So that is available on the, the website. We can't say we've completely summarized classical electromagnetics without the Lorentz force law. We will not use that in this course, but I want to mention we have to we have to include this to say we've summarized the, uh, the classical electromagnetics. Now, if we're modeling things in moving ma media, moving materials, then we have to account for this. But we're not going to do that. So in this class, we will not incorporate the Lorentz force law. The first of Maxwell's equations is called Gauss's law. And in differential form, we are writing it as the divergence of the D field equals the charge density. So that means if we have charge, the D field will appeal, appear to diverge from positive charges or converge to negative charges. Now in our finite difference time domain codes, we will be modeling waves and we will, unless we intentionally place charges there, that charge term is zero. So for us, del dot D equals zero. And what's the consequence of that? That means the D field can't diverge. That means the D field has to form loops. We have a similar equation for Gauss's law for the magnetic field. And here we have the divergence of B equals zero. There are no magnetic charges. And so if the B field cannot diverge, again, the only thing it can do is form loops. So the B field also forms loops. There's another consequence of having zero divergence. And if we have a plane wave traveling through some material, and we have del dot D, and then we plug in an equation for a plane wave where it has some polarization and it propagates according to e to the minus jk dot r, and we work through the math, what we see is that the direction of the wave and the polarization of the D field, the dot product is zero. So that means K and D are orthogonal to each other. And a similar line of reasoning, K, the direction of the wave, and B are also orthogonal. Then we move into the, the first of the curl equations, and this is called Ampere's Law with Maxwell's correction. And Maxwell's correction really was this derivative of D. But anyway, the, what this is saying is that the magnetic field does circles around currents and also time-changing D fields. And we can think of it the other way around. We could induce a D field that will cause a circulating H, or a circulating H would induce a D field, or a current. Now, in our formulation, we are going to ignore the current. Uh, so if we're modeling a wave in some kind of dielectric or in outer space, there are no metals, there are no currents, we can ignore that term. Now if we want to account for loss, that term needs to come back in. So, But the picture associated with this is we have a, a D field 
and then we have this circulating electric field around it. So the magnetic field is doing circles, the magnetic field H is doing circles around the D fields. Our other curl equation, Faraday's law, says basically the same thing but different fields. What it is saying is that the electric field E does circles around a time changing B field. And this is also reversible. If we started with a circulating E field, that would induce a change in the B field. Or if we change the B field, that would induce an, encir an encircling E field. So the picture here is we have our E field, and then we have our B field doing circles around it. So these pictures of magnetic fields doing circles around electric fields and electric fields doing circles around magnetic fields this will come up again when we start doing finite difference approximations of the derivatives and it will help us understand what's happening. So here's the big consequence of the curl equations. The curl equations predict waves. They predict propagation, radiation, whatever we call it. And it comes down to this. A time-changing electric field will induce a time-changing magnetic field. The time-changing magnetic field induces a time-changing electric field and it starts all over again and it, it daisy chains. So here's a my picture of what, what is happening here. Let's say we start off with a magnetic field changing in time. That will induce an encircling electric field, which is also changing in time now. So let's look at the electric field right at this point. So it's oscillating in this direction. Now we have a time changing electric field which will induce an encircling magnetic field. So let's look at the magnetic field at this point. It is time changing again in the vertical direction like it was over here. That induces an encirculating, an encircling electric field. And if we focus on the electric field here, it's now oscillating in and out, which induces an encircling magnetic field. And this just goes on and it hops back and forth. Now, the radiation does not just happen in this one direction. In fact, if we start off with a, a dipole, if you will, it has a donut radiation pattern. We won't get radiation in the vertical direction we get the strongest radiation in this transverse direction and it gets weaker as we look at angles with, with steeper angles. And so the famous donut pattern. But that's a consequence of curl equations. Waves, radiation, propagation. So here is the starting point then from our discussion of all electromagnetic analysis. We have our four Maxwell's equations now notice something very interesting about Maxwell's equations. Do we see permittivity or permeability anywhere in Maxwell's equations? Interestingly, uh, and you may be able to win a bet on this sometime, we can say Maxwell's equations don't directly tell us how electromagnetic waves interact with materials. And why can I say that? Because permittivity and permeability don't appear in Maxwell's equations. But we have the constitutive relations. This is where the permeability and permittivity come in. And it turns out the D field is really a convolution between a time-changing permittivity and a time-changing electric field. And likewise, the B is a convolution between a time-changing permeability and the magnetic field H. Um, so we can think of Maxwell's equations more as what produces fields. What field is inducing another field and how that works. The constitutive relations is really how it interacts with the materials. Now, the reality is these are happening together, so it's, it's, we can't physically separate them. We can certainly do it mathematically and, and ascribe some physical meaning to that. We also need to introduce the concept of a tensor. Let's say we start off with a vector V, and it's pointing in some direction, has some magnitude in some direction. If we multiply it by a scalar a, we get a new vector. It is in the same direction as the original vector, it's just that it changes its magnitude by a. It might even point in the other direction if a was negative. But the point is, if we multiply a vector by a scalar, the direction stays the same, it's just the magnitude that changes. A tensor is a generalization to this. We start off with our same vector, but if we multiply by a tensor, it can not only change the magnitude of the vector, but also its direction. And we can go from any direction magnitude to any other direction and magnitude. So this tensor is a three by three matrix of numbers, assuming your vector only has three elements. 
So you have a three by three matrix of numbers. But think of what this means. Um, the x component of this new vector will be axx times vx plus axy times vy plus axz times vz. That means any three components, any of the three components from the vector can leak into the x component of the new vector and so on. And this really just says it can happen in any combination. So a tensor is a generalization to a scalar so that we can also affect the direction of a vector in addition to its magnitude. That's important because these tensors appear in the constitutive relation. Now, in the easy case of linear, isotropic, and non-dispersive materials, our, dispersive, our, our constitutive relation is just D equals epsilon times E, just a simple multiplication, very, very easy. This is what we will use throughout the semester, but I, I at least want to take one slide to show that there's actually a whole lot more complexity here. In fact, the, the real constitutive relation is a convolution. The permittivity can actually be changing with time. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is in a few slides, but it's, a, it's really a convolution in the time domain. But if this is not dispersive, that's where it would be changing with time. It's just a simple multiplication. For anisotropic materials, this permittivity is a tensor. And if it's anisotropic and dispersive, we have a convolution with a tensor. It gets even more complicated. But with anisotropic materials, we have a tensor here. And then with nonlinear materials, the, the, the constitutive relation is even more complicated, and it's some kind of polynomial expansion. And in fact, here the permittivity becomes a function of the strength of the electric field, and some weird, interesting things happen here. But a neat part about this if we pull the constitutive relations out of Maxwell's equations, then Maxwell's equations are independent of the materials. We can write a finite difference time domain code, spend a, invest a lot of time in getting that to work really, really well, and then any other complicated material property we may want to include in our model simply inserts into this constitutive relation. We don't have to touch anything else in the code. So it's very useful and makes our code more modular to pull out those constitutive relations and treat those separately as a separate step. Then if we want to put in something anisotropic suddenly, we don't have to touch most of our code, just that simple little constitutive relation step. Talk a little bit more about anisotropic materials. Here, our permittivity is a tensor, so we really have a three by three matrix of numbers, and so D is this tensor times E. So in fact, the D field and the E field can be in different directions. Now, for our analysis, what we are going to do is we are going to make this tensor only diagonally anisotropic. If it were isotropic, these three numbers would be the same. We are going to let them be different, and this is for later on when we incorporate our perfectly matched layer. We'll, we'll need that. But this is called diagonally anisotropic. The way we're formulating it, uh, the off-diagonal terms have to be zeros. And it turns out incorporating anisotropy isn't quite as easy as just putting non-zero numbers off the diagonal. There's more to it than that. Uh, we'll mention it later on this semester, but we're not going to handle that in our codes. But we will let them be diagonally anisotropic. So there are some limited configurations where we can model anisotropic materials, but the codes will develop. But this lets us write our constitutive relation now as a set of three equations, where we relate the x component of D to the x component of E, and then the y components and the z components. Another thing I'll mention about tensors, and we're going sidetracking a little bit, but there's really only three degrees of freedom in a tensor. So they'll all start off being diagonally anisotropic. And in fact, any tensor, if we choose the right coordinate system, becomes diagonally anisotropic. The only way we get numbers in these off-diagonal terms is if we rotate our coordinate system. But we can't just arbitrarily choose nine different numbers and see what happens. There's only three numbers that we pick, three different permittivity values. We get those off-diagonal numbers by rotating the coordinates of our finite difference time domain analysis relative to the coordinates of that anisotropic material. Another thing that happens a lot is simplifying Maxwell's equation. So I just want to show you this. We tend not to do this a whole lot in finite difference time domain, but 
uh, it comes up often enough that uh, let's discuss it. One common thing is that we assume no charges or current sources. That means this row term is zero, and it means this J term is zero. And there certainly are uses for making those non-zero, but we're not going to address those this semester. But if we assume those are zero, Maxwell's equation is reduced to this. Second, if we, ha if we assume linear, isotropic, and non-dispersive materials, our convolutions and also tensors just become a simple multiplication. This really, really simplifies things, and we can still model a heck of a lot of stuff. So this isn't that severe, but we won't be able to model things that are anisotropic or dispersive. We'll talk about that later. But anyway, now we have a, a simpler form of Maxwell's equations. And then another thing that happens a lot are the constitutive relations are substituted back into Maxwell's equations. So we have a set of four equations that contain only E and H. Now we see the permeability and the permittivity appear in Maxwell's equations, both in the curl equations and the divergence equations. And very often in the literature, these are called Maxwell's equations. And we get programmed to think that way. But those aren't pure Maxwell's equations anymore. Those are Maxwell's equations that have the constitutive relations substituted back in. Boundary conditions. This ends up being uh, important, and this will be considered in our codes, but it turns out there's a real simple way to handle this, that we do one simple little thing, and our physical boundary conditions are, are handled everywhere. We don't have to program into each cell a, a separate special case of where boundaries are and how to handle the fields. We don't have to do that. But the physical boundary conditions, recall from electromagnetic theory, the transverse component of both the E field and the H field is continuous across the interface. Has to be the same on both sides, but right up against the interface. The normal components of E and H are not continuous across the interface. They're different magnitudes. However, the product of the permittivity times the normal component of the electric field, that product is continuous across the interface. Likewise, the product of the permeability times the normal component of the magnetic field, that product is also continuous across the interface. When we start talking about waves, we'll have wave vectors associated with them, describing the direction and the wavelength of the wave. The transverse component of the wave vector is also continuous across the interface. So we will call these our physical boundary conditions. Uh, later on, we're going to discuss something called numerical boundary conditions, and that's something else entirely that happens when we start doing the finite difference uh, equations and update equations. Now, we don't need to know a whole lot about this for finite difference time domain, but it is useful to physically interpret E and D. And it, it turns out there's really two ways that we can have electrical energy. We can have the type of electrical energy that exists in outer space. Those are our electric fields. We can think of that sort of as the initial push. Or we can displace charges. Like when we charge a capacitor, we push charges to separate locations, and that is also electrical energy. At the atomic scale, we have a nucleus and surrounded by this electron cloud. If we apply an electric field to that, it turns out it will push the nucleus one way and the electron cloud the other way. So we, we have the electrons buzzing around the nucleus, but they're spending more of their time on one side than the other. And we call this, we, we say that the material has been polarized when this, when this happens. And so we can talk about the polarization of the material, not to be confused with polarization of a wave. But here we're also storing electric energy. So we have the type of electric energy that can exist in outer space. Obviously, this displaced charge type can't exist in outer space because there's no matter to do this with, or at least very, very little. So we have the type of electric field that can exist in outer space. We can have both at the same time. So the D field is really the thing that includes both the push from E and displaced charge. This is why we call it, this is why we use the word D because it stands for displacement. And we can, even in outer space, it makes sense to talk about a D field because we can pretend that charge has been displaced. So that's physically what's happening with E and D.
There's an analogous thing with H and B. H is sort of the initial push. It's one way that we can store magnetic energy. That exists in outer space. But at the atomic scale, uh, very often we can have circulating charges. Those induce magnetic dipoles, and they can tilt. And when they're tilted, they want to restore themselves, so they're storing energy. And so the B field is the all-inclusive one that includes not only the sort of the outer space push, but also this these tilted dipole moments. So that's the difference between H and B, and it's analogous to the difference between E and D. It's not critical, really, to know this for finite difference time domain, but I think it's useful in some way. On to our next discussion, which is important. We need to understand how a bunch of different parameters are related. Impedance, refractive index, permittivity, uh, radial frequency, ordinary frequency, all these types of things. Because when you're, you're specifying a problem, you'll describe it probably just in terms of a certain set of those parameters, and we might need another set for our models. So we have a dielectric constant. And if we look at one of Maxwell's curl equations where the curl of H equals epsilon times the derivative of E. Now remember, this is not a pure Maxwell's equation. We substituted in the constitutive relation. But we can look at this curl equation, and we, we already have said, if we have a time-changing electric field, that will induce an encircling magnetic field. Or likewise, if we start off with an encircling magnetic field, that will induce a change in the E field. Well, the permittivity is the proportionality constant for that change. If we have a very large permittivity, it will take a large curl to induce the same change in the electric field. So we can also think about bringing the permittivity over here. So we have one over epsilon. So for a given strength of, a, of an encircling magnetic field, if we have a large permittivity, it will make that total number over here smaller and we'll get a smaller change in the E field. But the permittivity is really just the proportionality constant of how strongly a time-changing E field induces an encircling magnetic field, or the other way around, an encircling magnetic field induces a change in the E field. Here's a table of dielectric constants to give you a feel for the numbers. Air has a dielectric constant of one. Your typical plastics have a dielectric constant of two and a half. Um, our other curl equation now the permeability is our proportionality constant. We also have a negative sign here, the handedness changes in this equation, but an, an encircling electric field induces a change in the magnetic field at the center of that circulation, and the permeability is the proportionality constant. Here's a table of permeabilities. Uh, air has a permeability of one. We will tend to ignore this through most of this uh, most of this semester, but we will definitely include it in our codes. It's just that when we model things, we tend to ignore that, but certainly play around with it, see how that affects things. We have refractive index. We see the permittivity and the permeability. They appear in Maxwell's equations. So those are what are most fundamental to Maxwell's equations. However, I can't look at the permittivity and permeability and interpret too much physical from those. They're just these fundamental constants that plug into Maxwell's equation somehow. Refractive index is a much more intuitive parameter. That's telling us something now about the wave. And it, it turns out the refractive index is the factor by which a wave slows down relative to the speed of light when it enters a material. In outer space, a wave travels at the speed of light. As soon as it enters some kind of material, it starts interacting with that material and it slows down. So if refractive index is two, it slows down by half. So it's traveling half the speed of light. So how do we calculate the refractive index? We calculate that from the relative permeability and the relative permittivity. We multiply those together, take the square root, and we have refractive index. Now in most materials, we can ignore or it has almost zero magnetic response, so the relative permeability would just be one, and the refractive index squared in this case equals the permittivity, or refractive index equals square of the relative permittivity. We also call this relative permittivity dielectric constant. So if I give you on a problem just refractive index, 
unless I say otherwise, you can immediately assume that we're ignoring the magnetic response and we can just square refractive index to get the permittivity. It's a very, very common mistake that I give you refractive index and you plug that same number in for permittivity and it doesn't work. Well, that's because you have to square refractive index to get the permittivity. But we eventually need to convert everything over to permeability and permittivity because that's what our finite difference time domain engine will operate on because that's what is in Maxwell's equations. We have the material impedance. So if we have a wave, we have an oscillating electric field, we have an oscillating magnetic field, they won't be the same amplitudes. And it turns out the ratio of those amplitudes, that is the impedance. They not only could have different amplitudes, they could have different phase. So the impedance is really a complex number because E and H can be, have, have different amplitudes and different phase. So how do we calculate the impedance? It's really the ratio of the permeability over permittivity. And so if we use the relative permeability and relative permittivity, we'll take the square root of those and we multiply by the impedance of free space, which is about 377 ohms. So impedance is really just a balance between the electric and the magnetic fields in terms of amplitude and phase. And we'll use the material impedance when we start talking about sources if we want to inject a plane wave, we need to figure out what the E field and the H field is, and we need to be consistent with the physics, so we have to calculate impedance to get that right. Another point of confusion is omega versus F. Omega is the angular frequency. It's radians per second. And that tends to be the easier one to use in equations because it more, di more directly relates to phase and to our wave number k. So you've probably seen cosine omega t. It's just an easier thing to write. Physically, however, the ordinary frequency f seems to have more meaning because it relates more directly to time. But now we're using a cosine 2 pi f t, which is clearly a little bit more complicated than just a cosine omega t. But the period of the wave is 1 over the frequency. Anyway, they're related. Omega is 2 pi f, and don't confuse those. If I give you a frequency in hertz, but the equation has an omega in it, don't put in the hertz units for omega. Omega does not have hertz units. It's radians per second, whereas f is hertz, or 1 over seconds. Wavelength and frequency. We have a simple equation that says the speed of light is the frequency of the wave times the free space wavelength. Now, a lot of times in a lot of equations, you'll see just lambda. Uh, I rarely, rarely use that because that is rather ambiguous. Sometimes they mean the free space wavelength. Other times, a lambda alone means whatever the wavelength happens to be inside of a material. When the wave slows down, the wavelength reduces, and probably the more conventional thing is a lambda alone means the wavelength inside the material, but when I see lambda, I immediately, I don't know what the person's talking about. I try to read the context of what's happening and maybe I can figure it out, maybe I can't. So in pretty much everything I do, I never use lambda. I use lambda not. But in general, if a wave slows down, the velocity of that wave is its frequency. Frequency never changes times the wavelength inside whatever the material is. And so the velocity is the speed of light divided by a refractive index. But I think it's very dangerous to use lambda. So I would always use lambda naught. And it turns out lambda and lambda naught are related through refractive index. We'll take lambda naught, divide by refractive index, and that gives us the wavelength inside the material. Sign conventions. We can describe waves as e to the minus j beta z or waves as e to the plus j beta z. And both of those can be used to describe propagation in the forward z direction. And in fact, it doesn't matter. You'll see both. However, whatever you choose, you need to stay consistent with. You can't mix the two because they won't be compatible. So here's a little table summarizing the differences and the implications. So in the minus j beta z convention, here's how you would write a, a plane wave traveling in the positive z direction. For the e to the 
positive J beta Z convention, here's how we would write it. Notice there's a negative sign out here in front of the J. So this has implications in how we write our complex permittivity and even our refractive index. Notice there's a negative sign here on the imaginary components of those two. Whereas in the plus J beta Z convention, we have positive signs. So I can't tell you which one I like better or which one's the most popular. Uh, it seems to be different communities use different conventions. I think the physicists and chemists tend to use the E to the plus J beta Z more and the electrical engineer types tend to use the minus e to the minus j beta z more. But you'll see a mix everywhere. Just be cautious of that. Here's just a quick summary of all the different parameter relations. Uh, our permittivity, we can write as the free space permittivity times the relative permittivity, or it's also called dielectric constant. So all the units of permittivity are lumped into this free space term. So the relative term has no units. And then the free space number, it's 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. And we can do the same thing with the permeability. We can write it as the free space permeability times some factor. And that's called the relative permeability. Anyway, we have refractive index impedance, wave velocity, frequency and wavelength. And so in one slide, here's everything I think you'll need for this semester. If not, let me know. I'll add it. And we'll end the electromagnetic discussion. I want to show that there's a duality between ED, uh, between ED, H, and B. So the duality is E and H in, in many ways can be interchanged. D and B can be interchanged. The polarization of the material and the magnetization are interchangeable parameters and epsilon and mu are interchangeable. So what this means is if we go into Maxwell's equations and we do some math, we eliminate the magnetic fields and we solve the problem in terms of the electric field, we'll get some big ugly equation. If we do the same thing again, but instead mathematically eliminate the electric field and put everything in terms of the magnetic field, we will get the exact same equation at the end. However, wherever there was E's, now there will be H's. Wherever there was D's, there'll be B's. Wherever there was an epsilon, there'll now be a mu. And so the duality is very useful. And I use this all the time when I'm deriving equations for things like finite difference, time domain, or even other methods. I'll derive it twice, once for the E field, once for the H field. And in the end, I should see the same equation with duality. If I see a difference, I know I've made a mistake and I can go back and, and figure out where my mistake was. So I use this all the time for error checking. But it also tells us things like if we make a device that's purely dielectric and it does something really cool, we can make it do that same cool thing simply by removing the dielectric response and making an equivalent magnetic response. Now we may not be able to find the materials in, in real life to do that, but in principle we can do that. Okay, finally, on to finite difference time domain. Now you're experts in MATLAB and electromagnetics. In reality, all of Maxwell's equations, they're simultaneously coupled and happening at the exact same time. In finite difference time domain, we're going to look at this a little bit different, and we're going to look at Maxwell's equations as if there's a sequence of events happening. And so it's going to work like this. We can choose to start anywhere. So let's start in the upper left. What we'll do, based on the curl of the electric field, we will change the value of B. We'll increase it or decrease it depending on the sign of the curl. So we'll calculate the curl and update the B field based on that at the center of this curl. So we will update the B field from the E field using this curl equation. Given this B field, we can then calculate the H field through the constitutive relation. Now we go to the other curl equation. We'll calculate the curl of H. And based on that curl, we'll update the D field at the center of that curl. So we'll update D from H. Then we go to the other constitutive relation. We know D. We'll know the permittivity. And so we'll update the E field from the D field.
Now we know the E field again. We'll update the B field from the E field. Then we'll update the H field from the B field. Then we'll update the D field from the H field. Then the E field from the D field, and so on. And so we think of this as a sequence. And as long as the time steps are small enough, this works perfectly fine. And so this is how finite difference time domain views the interaction of Maxwell's equations and the constitutive relations, which a lot of times I'll just call Maxwell's equations, even though that's technically improper. But if you can let me be lazy, I would appreciate that. So that's the flow. We can similarly substitute the constitutive relations into the curl equations and now think of the finite difference time dimension a little bit simpler. We will calculate the curl of the electric field. We'll divide that by the permeability and now we know how much we can change the magnetic field at the center of the curl. So we update the H field from the curl of the E field. In the exact same manner, we'll update the E field from the curl of the H field. So we update H from E, update E from H. Update H, update E, update H, update E, and H, E, H, E, H, E, H, E. So you can imagine your algorithm running very fast now. E, H, E, H, E, H, E, H, and it bounces back and forth. That's the engine behind finite difference time domain. At first, everything's zero, and just doing this, everything stays zero. Nothing interesting is happening yet. So at some point, we'll talk about incorporating sources and other things. But this is the basic engine behind finite difference time domain. Sometimes it's called a leapfrog algorithm. Well, the method is called finite difference time domain, so we have to talk about finite difference approximations. Computers don't immediately know what to do with analytical derivatives. We need to make everything numerical. It's operating on an array of numbers, so we need some way based on storing the field value at discrete points in our grid. How do we calculate derivatives based on that? In Maxwell's equations, there's only first order derivatives, and so we only need to talk about that. And in fact, the derivative on this slide is the only derivative, the only finite difference approximation we will need for this entire course. And we will call this a second order accurate first order derivative. So suppose we have a one dimensional function and we'll know the value at discrete points. I'm only showing these two here. So we know the function at f1 and f2, but we probably know the others. What we would like to do is estimate the slope of this function at the midpoint between f1 and f2, just using the values f1 and f2. How do we do that? Well, the first order derivative is slope. Slope rise over run. So we'll see f2 minus f1, that's the rise. So f2 minus f1, we're talking about this delta. And the run is delta x. So basically, the change in the f's over delta x gives us a pretty good estimate as to what the first order derivative is at the midpoint. The key is at the midpoint. So that is called a central finite difference. And this is the only finite difference approximation we will need for this course. So we'll go to Maxwell's equations, and everywhere we see a derivative, we will somehow approximate it with finite differences. Now there's a really, really important rule anytime we apply a finite difference method, whether it's time domain, frequency domain, or something else. But every term in the equation has to exist at the same point in time and space. So. We start off with this differential equation, so the first order derivative of f plus f has to equal zero. Well, and we're, we're, we're storing this as the function stored at zero, at delta x, at two delta x, so this is our linear array of all our f values. So we will approximate our derivative this way. Here's our difference in f between two different positions divided by the distance between those positions plus f equals zero. So if we look at that, is there a problem? In fact, there is. This finite difference, remember, exists at the midpoint because it's a central finite difference. So we've calculated a term that actually exists at x plus delta x over 2. It's the midpoint between these two different values of x. Whereas just f of x exists at x. 
those two are not compatible. This simulation may work at first, but it'll eventually explode. That's not a valid finite difference equation. This is what we need to do. We have our first order derivative, which exists at x plus delta x over two. We need to add to it f at x plus delta x over two. However, we're not storing that. We're only storing f at zero, at x, at delta x, two delta x. We don't have it at the midpoints. So what can we do? Well, let's take an average. Here we have our first finite difference and it exists at the midpoint between x and x plus delta x. Well, now we're taking an average of f of x and f of delta x, but we're dividing by two. We're adding instead of subtracting and dividing by two to calculate an average. So this term now is essentially interpolating f at the midpoint, just like it is up here. This is a valid finite difference equation. So that one will work for us. So when we convert Maxwell's equations to finite difference form, we will apply these rules and we will make sure that every term not only exists at the same point in space, but also the same point in time. And that will become very important. So we're good. That's a valid finite difference equation. Let's think about approximating the time derivatives. Well, we, we know we have spatial derivatives inside the curl operator, but we'll delay that conversation for next lecture. And we'll just assume that we can do that. But we have this time derivative of h and the time derivative of e. So let's just go ahead and do that. We calculate a finite difference for h and the same finite difference for e. So if there's anything wrong here, let's think about where these exist in time. This exists at the midpoint. So we have t and t plus delta t. So this term actually exists at t plus delta t over two. However, this curl operator exists at t. Right away, these are not compatible. And the same thing down here. This term exists at the midpoint. However, right now, h exists at t. Those two are not compatible. So we have problems. So we have an unstable formulation right now. So how do we handle this? A very clever solution here is to stagger E and H in time. So the E's and the H's will exist a half time step apart. So we will say that the electric field exists at the integer time steps. That's zero, delta T, two delta T, three delta T, so on. The H field will exist at the half time steps. So that'll start off at delta T over two, and then three delta T over two, then five delta T over two. And let's see what this lets us do. Let's look at our first curl equation. We're going to approximate that first order derivative this way with a central finite difference. So we're calculating the H field at the half time steps. That's good. But this term will exist at the midpoint between these two arguments. And that midpoint is exactly T. That's exactly where the electric field exists. So this is a working equation. Now let's look here. The electric field exists at integer time steps. So we're only calculating at integer time steps. When we calculate a finite difference, it exists at the midpoint between these two, which is t plus delta t over two. That's good. That's exactly where the h field exists in time. So we now have working equations. But maybe there's another problem. Do we have to interpolate these at the half time steps. And I already answered this in the beginning, we don't have to do that. We'll actually define the magnetic fields to exist at those half time steps, not the integer time steps. And in fact, if we needed an H field at an integer time step, we'd have to interpolate somehow. So that's exactly what happens. We, we stagger and now we can write our equations in a little bit more formal framework. We will have the curl of E at time t equals minus mu and here's how we'll write our finite differences and we'll write it this is at time t plus delta t over 2 minus h at t minus delta t over 2 
So this exists at an integer time step, which is exactly what we have here. Um, so this is a bit more formal way of writing the exact equation we had on the previous slides. And again, we're not going to talk about the derivatives in the curl operation. That'll happen in a following lecture. The next step we want to do, now that we have our finite difference equations, we want to derive what we'll call our update equation. So what we'll do, we'll start off with the finite difference equation we had on the last slide. We will look at the magnetic field at the future time value and solve this equation for it. So when we do that, we have the H field at the future time value equals the H field at the previous time step minus some kind of correction factor, which comes from the curl of E, and we have some constants collect here, delta T over the permeability. Delta T is the time step that we're marching our algorithm forward by. Likewise, we have our other equation, and we do the same exact thing. We, we look at the E at the future time step and solve this equation for it. So we have E at the future time step equals E at the previous time step plus a constant times the curl of H. So exactly what we said happen, is, needs to happen is going to happen. We'll calculate the curl of E, we'll multiply it by delta T over mu, and update H based on its previous value. And we'll do the same thing to update the E field. We'll calculate the curl of H, multiply that by delta T over epsilon, add that to the present value of E, and we've updated the E. So these are called our update equations. And so it's useful at this point to discuss the anatomy of the update equation because these will get bigger and uglier, but they'll all have the same form. And so it all starts off with, on the left-hand side, the field at the future time step. Inside here, our next term will be the field at the previous time step or the current time step. And then this update term. We have a bunch of constants that come to the outside. These don't change during the course of the simulation. I guess we could change them, but that would be a stranger, more sophisticated thing. But we won't change these. These are constants. So why should we keep calculating this ratio? And in fact, the best thing to do is not. So we will probably calculate this ratio ahead of time, and we'll call that our update coefficient. The curl, we will have to calculate each time because the magnetic field will be changing, so the curl of the other magnetic field will be changing. So that's our update equation. We have the field we're updating, its present value, update coefficients, and then terms like this curl. And there will be more terms as we go on, but they'll all have this basic anatomy still, even though the equations will be bigger and uglier. So here's our FDTD algorithm for now until we start adding bells and whistles. We will initialize all of the fields to be zero at all points in our grid. And then we enter our main finite difference time domain loop. This is what's marching over time. And our first step is to update H from E. And we use our H field update equation. Then we update E from H. And we repeat this. And what I actually do when I'm developing a finite difference time domain cause I'll actually do this and I'll make sure everything stays zero. It should. So this is a great check. If we initialize everything to zero and do these update equations and all of a sudden numbers start appearing, clearly we've made a mistake somewhere. Nothing should happen here. Everything should stay zero. But we're alternating EH, EH, EH updating. So maybe we start off with some E Based on E at time T, we'll calculate an H at a T plus delta T over two. Based on this H value at T plus delta T over two, we'll calculate E at T plus delta T. Based on this E value, we calculate an H at T plus three delta T over two. Based on that, we'll get an electric field at T plus two delta T, and we just, we leapfrog all the way down. This just keeps going and keeps going. But notice E and H's are staggered in time by a half time step and that's very important. 